Hello Internet. Today I want to talk to you about symmetry, symmetry in systems and what does it mean if we try to calculate the dynamic of a system. Now the simplest system we can think of are of course mechanical systems and we have here the Lagrangian mechanics and I want to show you today and my source is MIT Open Courseware from MIT and where you hear advanced classical mechanics. If you go to that link, I will provide you in the description, you can follow along. So you know that a mechanical system is defined by its Lagrangian. The Lagrangian function is a function that depends on the coordinate. On the time derivative of the coordinate, this means the velocity of the particles in the system, of the pointlet particles in the system, and of course, uh, the time. And you are familiar if you say, okay, if I have a function that defines the, the motion of my point like particles of the mechanical system, then you know that the emotions or the equations of motion for the system is defined by the principle of least action. It is also called the principle of stationary action to be precise. And you see here the formula. And of course, it is also called, uh, you know, Hamiltonian and Lagrangian uh, as the Hamiltonian principle. And it simply states that the Lagrangian, depending on our coordinate system, depending on the velocity of the particles in our closed system at the time, if I integrate from time t1 to time t2, then there is a parameter, let's call it action, so this integral is defined as, as s equals an action and the derivative of s equals zero. And this is the starting point for deriving our equations of motion, our, our Euler-Lagrange equation of motions that tell us here these two terms and you are familiar with the mechanical description of a system. Now, the interesting part in this is when you look about the symmetries and the dependencies on cyclic coordinates. And you know, a cyclic coordinate is one which does not appear in the Lagrangian or of course in the Hamiltonian of the system. And because given that the Hamiltonian of a system, and again, we have here the parameters, oops, come on. We have here the parameters, the function parameters Q for our coordinate system, P for our impulse, we are now in the phase space, and T, we have a canonical system where we have that the momentum has uh, equal representation to the coordinate system. This means we have here the Lagrangian integrated in this. Now, if for the coordinate Q, J, is absent in our Lagrangian function for some particular j, it means it is also absent, of course, in the Hamiltonian description, in the Hamiltonian of the system. And this absent of that uh, qj corresponds with a symmetry in the dynamics. Now, this is a very strong sentence, and it is based on Noether's theorem. And Noether's theorem tells us more or less in a very short presentation that a symmetry implies a cyclic coordinate, which in turn produces a conservation law. So we have a mechanical system. We describe the motions of the particle in this closed mechanical system, the equation of motion, and we say this is a physical law. And within this law, we can define a conservation law, given that there is a symmetry in the system. And in the mathematical description, you know, there is a cyclic coordinate in, for example, the equation of motions. This is really interesting because Noether's theorem, you can apply it to quite a lot of, you know, of instances. So let's jump now about 10, 20, 30 years in the future and let's have a look what Feynman told his students, given his, fam his famous Feynman lectures. And we have a look at the Feynman lectures on physics and we go to volume one, mainly mechanics. You see here under 52.3, the symmetry and conservation laws, before we go to broken symmetry in, in quantum physics, uh, Feynman states that, for example, that the laws are symmetrical for translation in space. So this means if I do my experiment here in Vienna, 
and you do your experiments somewhere in India or, or Asia or America or Africa, we should get more or less the same results. And when we add the principle of quantum mechanics, yes, it turns out to mean that the momentum is conserved. So, symmetry of our physical laws regarding a translation in space. So if I move around in space, turns out that we can deduct that there is some conserved quantity, some momentum is conserved. And you might ask, okay, and when is the energy of the system conserved? And I just showed you in the mechanical system, but also in quantum mechanics, that the laws are symmetrical under translation in time. And this leads directly, mathematics, that the energy of the system is conserved. And of course, if you have a rotational symmetry, it's a fixed angle in space, of course, and you have non-disturption of the space-time continuum with some gravity. Of course, this is quantum mechanics in a non-relativistic gravitational string tensor, multi-string uh, dark matter universe. So this is just Feynman plane quantum electrodynamics. We have a conservation of angular momentum. Of course, if you have some broken symmetry, like parity or something else, it will become really interesting in theoretical physics. But this is not the point because what we want to have a look is why is this relevant for graph neural networks? And the next step would be to show you now that the origin of this was discovered a little bit before in the 19th century by uh, some mathematician also close to my home here uh, in Erlangen. Now, if you're a little bit familiar with mathematics and you say, hey, this was trivial, this was much too simple. Okay, just a very short excursion to Klein and Klein geometry. And I refer here to the Wikipedia page where there's just one sentence I want to show you. Um, it is about the Klein geometry. And it says, it is a homogeneous space together with a transitive action on this space by a Lie group, which acts as the symmetry group of the geometry. Uh, you either might say, hey, this sounds great. I understand it immediately. Or I might say, hey, could you maybe explain the terms for me? So here we go. A homogeneous space. A homogeneous space. And again, here, the Wikipedia definition. Uh, in the theory of Lie groups, algebraic groups, or topological groups, a homogeneous space for a group is a non-empty manifold, non-empty manifold, on which G acts transitively. Transitively, you know, you have three parameters, let's say A equals B, and you have a parameter C, and you know A equals C, then you can say, okay, B equals C, transitively. So a homogeneous space for a group G is a non-empty manifold on which G acts transitively. So, great. Then there was the problem of a Lie group. A Lie group is a group that is a differentiable manifold. And you see, eh? So a manifold is a space that locally resembles a Euclidean space, you know, the space you know, x, y, z coordinates, you have a, a, a distance of a, a matrix, an idea of distance, you have some metric induced and whatsoever, and it resembles an Euclidean space, whereas groups define the abstract generic concepts of multiplication and taking the inverse. So multiplication and division are defined on this manifold, on this differentiable manifold. And combining these two ideas, one obtains a continuous groups where points can be multiplied together and their inverse can be taken. If, in addition, the multiplication and taking of inverse are defined to be smooth, so differentiable, one obtains a Lie group. This is more or less the definition of a Lie group. And you say, hey, yeah, now I get it. So, of course, yeah, Klein find out that it is, if it is a homogeneous space together with a transitive action on this space by a Lie group, which acts as a symmetry group of the geometry, now things become clear to me. 
Congratulations! Now, after physics and after mathematics, we will enter now the area of the neural networks, of graph neural networks, and understand that the property of symmetry and the property of some conservation is also important in analyzing, let's say, your, your vision. Because if you are driving in a Tesla and you get this two-dimensional grid, this photo from the area in front of you, mapping a real physical system, the world outside, to a two-dimensional array, and you have to identify which objects in these pictures are cars and which objects in these pictures are trees, you have an additional structure of your input parameter. Because what you have as an input is a picture. And a picture is just a, a two-dimensional grid, an array of pixels. And each pixel has a value, let's say a gray value. And the combination of all these pixels gives you an object and you interpret that this object can resemble a car or a tree. So, but the, in, the data itself, since it is a two-dimensional grid, it has some properties. And these properties, like say translation invariance, reduces the possible transformations. It reduces the, the output space because since we know that this input space, this two-dimensional grid has a symmetry and has some symmetry operators, and if we apply a little bit thinking about Lie group and about Felix Klein, we understand that this has a limitation of the possible output functions, of the output space, of the topological space. So here we go for it. But hold your horses, yeah, the experts under you might say, hey, was there not something with a young Mills group and Grotch theory before we enter here the trivial area of neural network programming? And you are right. And here it comes back to bite me in my, <clears throat> because I forget to tell you when we were talking about Klein about the bundle, uh, the bundle. And the Gorge group, as we find here in Wikipedia, is a group of Gorge symmetry of the young Mills Gorge theory of principal connections on a principal bundle. Now, to understand this, you have maybe to understand a little bit of vector space and topological mathematics, but no problem at all. Uh, given the bundle and the Lie group structure, Gorge group is defined to be the group of its vertical automorphisms. <laughs> of course, I mean, you might say, hey, what else? Yeah, and gauge gravity theory, gauge theory, quantum gauge theory. No, 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 this is not what we are looking for. What we are looking for is gauge invariance. Yes, uh, non abelian gauge theories. And here we have it classical field theory. No, so 1954. So we're still 60, 70 years in the past have channelized the structure of quantum electrodynamics, where the abelian gauge group U1 is replaced by some non abelian Lie group of unitary matrices. And we have here the transformation, the global transformation. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. Uh, is, um, um, Lagrangian density is invariant under some global transformation belonging to the group G. And G is simply a space-time independent transformation. Uh, in addition, we assume that the Lagrangian density is preserved by this global transformation. And the goal is to promote the global invariance of the action to the invariance under the local transformation. And you have to proclaim the, the problem of derivatives, covariant derivatives, where the gauge field belongs to the Lie algebra of the group. And if you want to jump in here, I think it, it's a little bit too much for this video here right now. But uh, Lie algebra and, and gauge field is really important in theoretical physics. So if you want to know a little bit about it and about gauge fixing, oh yeah, 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 baby, this is it. Then have a look here, for example, in Schoolopedia or at the article of Gorge Invariance to understand a little bit more than I can tell you, but we're now going back to neural networks and find out what this um, invariance uh, on the particular structure of uh, a two-dimensional grid of a photograph on a pixel density can tell us and can restrict our output space, our output topological function that we're looking for. So back to neural networks.
and looking for some literature on graph neural networks and a little bit about some symmetry groups, I found this excellent archive preprint from May 2021 by Bronstein, Bruna, Cohen, and Velikovic. Archive 2104.13478 version 2, May 2021. This is astonishing piece of document, I have to tell you. I like it. It is exactly what I've been looking for. And and look what we have here. No, 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 no. Where is it? Where is it? I just found it. I was scanning through the document. If we can have here, here is exactly what we are interested in. Geometric deep learning. Okay. The physical domain. This is our omega. If this is our, our picture, let's say, our grid structure, where we have pixel right next to a pixel right next to a pixel and the content of the pixel is a different value of gray this is our, our grid domain and you can clearly see here that we have a, a symmetry a group that we have a symmetry within this domain so and then we have the space of signals and a signal for example is the the number three and the number three let's say covers i don't know 100 pixels but the specific form, the specific structure of this data forms, uh, forms, a, forms a code, a presentation that we identify as the number three. So we have the space of signal X of omega. And as you can see here, we have a symmetry group, a symmetry group on the domain omega. And it's a, a translation invariant or a shift invariant or equivariant to be specific where if we have the three here, let's say in the left corner, or if we have a three in the right corner of the pixel where we say that no border exists in our theoretical examples, then a three in the border down here or a three up top there, it is a three independent of the place where we detect it in our picture. Now, of course, if you do some image segmentation and you wanna have a relation of object to each other, this will be different, but for the moment, for the simple, most trivial case, we have a symmetry group operating on our grid domain. Of course, if we go, uh, if we map it into the space of signals X of omega, where we identify the number three, we have a group representation acting on this. And let's see, how does it say it? And the hyperdot, uh, we have three spaces. So we have the domain, the space of the signals, and the hypothesis class F on x von omega. So this is, let's call it the output class. And the symmetries of the domain omega captured by the group G act on signals x, x element of x of omega through group representations rho uh, of G imposing structure on the function. Uh, yeah, of course, Impo this is it, imposing structure on the function f, and f is a, a function in our output space, acting on such signal. Hmm, shift equivariant, this is nice. This is really nice, you know? Oh, wow, the development of neural network architecture with local weight sharing was motivated by the need for shift invariant object classification. I didn't know that. So, hey, this is a really nice in-depth presentation. My goodness, I'm going to read this because this is nice. So if you're interested a little bit in the background and in the deeper understanding of GNNs or uh, convolutional networks, I think this is really, this is, oh, 160 pages. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> 160 pages, but really, really recommend this paper to you just been aware and i like it geometric deep learning blueprint okay 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 five g's ah so we have our grid we have our input space we have groups yeah of course and here we have to do, yeah of course this is it huh? we have now if you ask for the difference between a vision a neural network and a graph neural network you can see here the, the, the structure of our input space. If we have a vision, if we have a, a picture, if we have a two-dimensional grid array of pixels, 
is completely different if you look at it from the symmetry point of view to input data where the data have a graph structure. Because let's say if you take here a pixel in the middle, you always know you have a pixel up and down and left and right. And here, if you take this red node, you only have one, one edge. You have only one connection to the next node. So you have not at all a translation symmetry, a translation invariance. You have a very different symmetry group, if at all. So therefore, you see why we have graph neural networks is based on the structure of our input data. Pixel has a very, very homogeneous structural element in its two-dimensional grid where all the pixels are right next to each other. Whereas in a graph, where you have to find a graph representation where your input data, you remember that each node can have some, some, some content can have some labels in it and edges two edges can have strength some some i don't know distance is the wrong word because we are not operating in euclidean structure oh yeah here you can say that with grids we are nearly euclidean structure but here there's no euclidean structure at all with our graph so i think this is it this is the main cause if i think about this right now that the input data the representation of the input data to a neural network are completely different if you have a vision neural network where you have some some grid structure where you have uh, in, sitting in your teslas you had a camera making two-dimensional grid mapping of the reality that you see and then you have to deduct the reality scenario the physical world scenario outside composing those eight input data and they have a grid structure but they have no depth structure they have a time series structure but to deduct the real world geometry from a time series of two-dimensional grids is not easy at all but if a graph structure especially a knowledge graph structure where you can encode some information on some classes and subclasses this is the difference between the neural network you apply for vision or for uh, NLPs where you have a linear sequence of words in a sentence to, uh, to the input data that are structured as a graph. Yeah, this is it. This is the explanation between the difference that I was asked so often in your comments. Hey, why do I need graph neural networks when I already have the neural networks for vision technology or for NLP? Why an additional structure? It is simple. The structure of the data, the space, the topological space that you provide your input information to the neural network is completely different in both cases. Yeah, and of course, okay, gorgeous here, frames for tangent spaces, tangent spaces here. If we have an S3 and we have some auto, the group of orthogonal uh, SO3, um, it's a little bit complicated. So this is nice. Let, let's finish after, my goodness, 28 minutes. Let's finish this video with a very nice recommendation for you to read. This is if you are on Christmas holiday and you say, hey, I want to understand a little bit more about graph neural networks. Read Geometric Deep Learning, Grids, Groups, Graphs, Geodesics, and Gorge Theory from Theoretical Physics er, from Bronstein, Bruna, Kohan, and Willikovich, May 2021. And we will leave the link to this preprint on the Archive server for you. And therefore, this is it for this video. And I know you're looking forward for the next very short video coming up in the next days. See you then.